Boethius's consolation of philosophy ends by introducing and dealing in a rather novel way with an, at that time, already old problem, the problem of divine foreknowledge, that is, whether God can know about things that are to come without thereby destroying human free will in the process. And this is a, a classic problem, not only in the philosophy of religion, where we're thinking about uh, conceptions of the divine and, and the divine's relation with the rest of, of uh, the universe, including human beings, but also in the philosophy of action, where we're thinking about questions about, well, what is freedom? And are human beings really free, or are they causally determined in some way? And how does action actually take place? Now, Boethius has pointed out to him in this, by philosophy, that this is not a radically new problem. As a matter of fact, it's been around for a long time. As a matter of fact, it's even been around longer than the sort of monotheistic matrix in which this, this might have been uh, a particularly pressing issue with the coming of Christianity into ancient culture. As she points out, Cicero, who is a Roman philosopher, somebody who's bringing Greek philosophy in, uh, in one of his works, actually in several of his works, brings up this issue of, of fate or destiny or providence. And the question is, and it comes up for the Stoics, how can we actually be free if, in fact, providence governs everything? Doesn't that take away free will? And the Stoics wanted to, as we say, have their cake and eat it too. They wanted to have both of these things to be true at the same time. They had to come up with some sort of account of how that could be the case. And it becomes an even more pressing issue for Christian philosophers because the Stoic God at least, you know, whatever God is or the divine is, is not really outside of the universe. It's, it's uh, somehow within the universe. I think it's a little murky about how that is. But for, you know, Judaism, Christianity, later on Islam, God is understood as this completely transcendent creator of all that that is, who in some way is there before it, who is all-knowing, all-powerful, all-good, uh, perfectly wise, arranges everything, and the, the bigger that we make God in this respect, the more and more other things seem to get pushed to the margins, you might say, including human free will. And this raises a lot of really pressing puzzles and problems, the, not the least of which is we do feel like we actually make decisions freely, but if God already knows what those decisions are, how much freedom is there in them? So, we're going to start out here by looking once again at this notion of providence, because that's the sort of lens that, that is leading us into it. And we go back over this distinction between providence and, and fate that Boethius made, a fairly interesting and useful distinction. It says that providence is divine reason. So, providence is not something separate from God. Providence is, in a certain respect, what God is, uh, because God is God's own reason. It's not like human beings where we may have a rational faculty, but that's not wholly what we are. For God, God's goodness, God's unity, God's reason uh, is entirely what God is. On the other hand, we have fate, which is this planned order which devolves from or makes happen within the, the world what it is that the divine reason has, has planned. That's what we actually come in contact with more directly. And you can think of it in, in these terms. Um, the providence itself is eternal. That is, in a certain way, it's either outside of time or it transcends time and encompasses all time. Whereas fate, the way he's understanding it, Fate is temporal. It happens within time. So, providence includes all things in the same time, the time of eternity, and fate controls individual motions of things at different times and at different places. So, it, you know, fate here is not the same thing as fate there. Fate now is not the same thing as fate then, although it's all bound together in one uh, gigantic, 
almost incomprehensible matrix. Another way that you could think about this is that providence is the plan of the craftsman. So when God is creating the universe, God doesn't just first make a few things and say, all right, go to it, let me see how this pans out, uh, let me tweak it here, let me tweak it there. God is actually doing all the things that God is going to do as far as the creative activity at every single point in time, or at least that's the plan, the plan of the craftsman. But then the execution of the plan um, is happening sequentially, in time, at different points in time, uh, at different places. And part of the execution is, is actually left, it's not happening directly from God, it may be left to natural processes, it may be carried out through the intermediary of other beings that were created to help out, um, traditionally those are called angels, it may happen through the intermediary of human beings and their decisions, and this is where we get to the really interesting part. How do human beings fit into this? It sounds kind of like, if this really is the case, then everybody has a destiny, and those destinies all sort of co you know, coincide and coalesce and intersect with each other, and you can't really get away from that, that destiny. So if that's the case, how are you actually a free being? And this is going to raise some, some really key problems for us, as we're going to see. This is how we could put the dilemma. When you have a dilemma, you're being presented with two alternatives, and if you, you can't pick uh, both, and you can't evade the dilemma, so you have to pick A or you have to pick B. And oftentimes when we pose a dilemma to somebody, we're saying um, you don't really like where A is going, and you also don't really like where B is going, so you're kind of, as we say, screwed either way. Um, that's what, a, what a, a dilemma often is. And this one seems to be like that, doesn't it? Because either we've got providence or we have human free will, and it doesn't seem like they're compatible. Now, why does the issue turn on foreknowledge? That's something that before we go into this dilemma, we ought to think a little bit about. What does foreknowledge actually mean? It's, it's literally knowledge that is of what is yet to come. So knowledge of the future. Not quite the same thing as the conception of prophesying, because prophesying means saying something about the future. So presumably, prophesying would rely on some sort of foreknowledge. And if God really has everything planned out, then that means that God has foreknowledge. But how can God have foreknowledge of what we call future contingents, of things that either could be or not be? For example, um, I'm wearing this jacket today. I've got a motivation for doing that. I like to keep the videos consistent across you know, a particular sequence of videos. Um, but I could have worn a different jacket. That was within my power to choose, right? That's a purely contingent thing that I'm wearing this jacket. Could, could be that some events had happened that made it impossible for me to wear this jacket. Perhaps the, you know, uh, apartment burned down and the jacket is lost with it. Somebody breaks in and steals that jacket. Um, I spill acid upon it and burn a hole in it. You know, all these things are, are possible. So if they're possible, if the future is not yet seemingly fixed, but could go different ways, how does God know it? That's one of the questions about divine foreknowledge. So let's look at the dilemma now. If providence foreknows all human actions, all our thoughts, even our desires, from eternity... What follows from that? Well, how can human beings have free will then? If God already knows that I'm going to choose to walk this way instead of walk this way, I'm not even going to walk this way because I want to show you I'm choosing this, to walk this way, right? Um, if God knows at that moment in time that I chose that, even though I didn't know in my head what I was going to do at that point, then I must have been fated to do it. How can I actually say that I'm free? 
Maybe, you know, everything is a bunch of brain states, neurons firing in our heads or something like that. Um, you know, can understand the brain as something like a wetware computer, the way that people like to do in science fiction-y things. That would actually kind of fit in with this idea. In that case, God is the one who actually knows the entire system. And since God can see all the neurons in your head and how they're connected up, God knows what you're going to do at each moment. And God knows this about everything else in the universe and how they're going to react to each other and interact. So we wouldn't have free will then, would we? We might have the illusion of free will, but we wouldn't actually have free will. That's one point of the dilemma. Do we want to accept that? Probably not. So let's say we go to the other side, you know? Um, if human beings have free will, then that raises some problems too, doesn't it? How can there actually be foreknowledge then? If I can choose at any given point what I'm going to do, how can God know about that ahead of time? Aren't those events up to the human being? Doesn't that make them not necessary or even uncertain? How can God know at any given point in time whether I am going to sing a song or dance a jig or blow my nose or start whistling or call the dog or just sit here and do nothing? God could know that about things that don't have free will, right? God can know whether the little bunny rabbit's going to jump left or right, or eat the grass, or eat the carrot. Um, but that's because that, that's just, you know, an animal without free will. When it comes to beings that actually do have free will, doesn't that introduce something what we can call a radical indeterminacy? Things not being settled into this entire system. It gets worse. Much of what we do with our free will is react to other people's uses of their own free will. So imagine now a system in which we have not just one thing with free will, making decisions about what's going to happen in the future, that presumably God's got to wait around and see. We have a whole bunch of them, all reacting to each other, uh, affecting each other. Whether Boethius writes this book or doesn't write this book, whether we think about these issues or not, free will. So, it seems like we either have to have foreknowledge coming from providential planning of every, everything from eternity, or we have free will, and we can't have both. That's the dilemma. Before he provides his own fairly long and detailed explanation about how it's possible to reconcile divine foreknowledge with human free will and to have them fully be what they are, without any sort of compromises, without any shaving off bits of them, Boethius is going to examine two other, what he considers, failing solutions to them, two solutions that actually are going to raise other problems and are not really getting to the heart of the matter. Now, one thing I do want to mention here is he talks about this as being a Gordian knot to unravel. The Gordian knot was a famous puzzle of antiquity, and it actually was a knot of, of cords tied together. A lot of people tried to solve it, but it was so massive, and there were so many things involved in it, that when you would pull on one part, you would think you were actually unraveling it, you'd actually make the other part tighter, and nobody could figure it out. So it's there. And it was, in fact, solved, if you want to call it that, by Alexander the Great who comes along and they say to him, now you must not be so great if you can't do this knot puzzle here. And he takes his sword and he cuts it right in half. And he says, problem solved. Now, is that really solving the problem? Uh, it depends on how you understand that. It. It's certainly one way of dealing with the problem. Boethius doesn't want to do that. Boethius wants to actually unravel all of the intellectual problems and puzzles and paradoxes involved in this. And so he's going to contribute a, a really interesting um, solution of his own. Perhaps it's not the only uh, plausible solution, but it's certainly one of them that's up there when, when you look at uh, people who are trying to think about these sorts of issues. But like I said, first he's going to examine two other proposed solutions that other people have put forward, and he's going to try to show why they don't actually work. One proposed solution that has, in fact, had some adherence in the past is to say that something that will happen in the future is foreseen by providence 
Not because Providence is doing something, but because Providence is kind of reacting. Providence is passively looking on and seeing what's going to happen with the, these sorts of things. Not really much of an issue for, say, natural phenomena that don't involve free will, like you know whether uh, the leaf is going to fall this way or that way, or whether the weather is going to be of a certain type at a certain day. But it is an issue for human affairs, for the human world, because human beings have free will. And we could represent it like this. You know, we, we think of our, our timeline as going from the past to the future. That's our typical conception of time, and we have events along the way. And we're always moving towards the, the future. You know, we can't get back into the past except perhaps by memory or something like that. But the past is fixed. Once something has happened, it's happened. And Providence takes in all of the different times, all these little slices of time. And so if we're thinking about a future free choice that a person is going to make, and we're going to keep it super simple here, do action A or do action B, until the person actually makes the choice, which is what it means to have free will, to be able to make the choice between those without something else determining that choice, until somebody makes that choice, we don't know which one they're going to do. After they've done that choice, we can say, okay, they did action A. They could have done action B, but they didn't do action B, so now that's sort of canceled out and we're not going to worry about it anymore. And Providence sees the choice going on and sees the action that results from it. And so because Providence has this kind of privileged situation as far as what it can see, Providence, or God, has foreknowledge of future events. It might even, you know, if we want to work this way backwards, um, when you make a New Year's resolution, and, you know, you can either break it at a whole bunch of different points, or you can persevere and follow through, God would see at every single point you either breaking it or, or following through. It would be sort of, you know, a present thing for God, but the reason why God sees that happening is because you choose that. Now, what would be wrong with this? It creates a kind of necessity but it seems like human actions are necessitating Providence. So doesn't that seem a little bit strange? Human beings are necessitating the way God has to be when God is supposed to be this, this planner who knows everything, who's all-powerful. How can we actually choose in such a way to make God be what God is? Because remember, Providence is the mind of God, is God's reason, is God itself. So this doesn't seem to be workable, because if you're allowing human beings to decide what, what God is, that's, uh, that seems a little sketchy, doesn't it? Now, Boethius also has another complaint about this sort of thing as well. Um, what kind of knowledge is this really? Is this really knowledge? When we talk about what comprises knowledge, we mean that we actually know something to be the case. So if somebody says, um, is it going to rain tomorrow or is it going to rain tomorrow? A valid response to that is, I don't know. Or you can say, well, I know that the weatherman says there's a 60% chance, but I also know that weatherman's estimates are, are often uh, incorrect. So let's set it between 40 and 80% chance. And, and I'll say that I know that, but it's just a probability. I don't really know it. When it comes to contingent things, particularly things that are dependent on human free will, can we say that we truly have knowledge about them? If we do, then what kind of knowledge could that possibly be? Boethius uh, has philosophy talk about this in this way. If anyone thinks something is different from what it is, not only is it not knowledge, but it's a false opinion very far from the truth of knowledge. So if something is destined to happen in a way, in such a way 
that its occurrence is not certain and necessary, who could foreknow that it is to happen? For just as knowledge is unalloyed by falseness, that which is understood by knowledge, comprehended by knowledge, cannot be other than it's actually understood. So when, when God, according to this viewpoint, sees the free choice, he grasps, or it grasps, whatever God is, the choice and is supposed to have knowledge about it, but it's not really knowledge of a free choice. It's just knowledge of what actually happened. In a way, this is taking knowledge away from God. Do you, this may take a little bit to sink in, but it's worth thinking about. Knowledge, in this understanding that Boethius is articulating, knowledge needs to be of the free choice, as the free choice, as something contingent. But that seems to be ruled out by the very understanding of knowledge that we're working with here. So this solution deals with things. It seems to reconcile them by saying that, well, you know, providence just sees what, what we've already, you know, what we're doing down the line and deciding, and we're in some way, because we're making that choice, that's why God grasps things the way God does. That's why it's part of the divine plan. That seems to make the plan rather capricious, doesn't it? It's not much of a plan at all. So that's one big problem. The second solution that Boethius is going to consider is really the flip side of the first, and it's a reaction to the first. If you're going to say, well, you know, given the idea that we're, we're working with here, that somehow the events necessitate God's understanding or God's foresight, that's not really knowledge, and that wouldn't be appropriate, you know, for what we're discussing here, then we can say, well, no, God actually does have knowledge in the full sense. God knows exactly what's going on from all eternity. Foreknowledge really is knowledge and it binds human thoughts and actions to only going one particular way. Well, if that's the case, then we're back at square two, you might say, or square one, depending on which side of the dilemma you're looking at, and we don't have free will. Now, if that's the case, there's some other problems that come up. Notice what Boethius is doing here. He's saying, look, we, we believe this, and, and this makes sense over here, but if we adopt this point of view, this stuff, we have to throw it all out. So that can't possibly be correct. What are these considerations? He's got two that he brings up that are particularly trenchant. One is, how can there actually be any sort of reward for virtue and punishment for vice, if that's the case? How, how is it that providence which is supposed to give good things as a reward to good people, including to those who actually turn to goodness and develop in goodness, and give bad things to bad people as their punishment. That's the understanding of providence that he's working with. How can that possibly be the case? Because it seems like the people who actually develop virtues, who act in good ways, who do the right thing, they don't really have a choice about it. They're fated to do so. So why are they deserving of anything, if that's the case? Isn't it kind of unfair to give them a reward for what they would do anyway? Likewise, the people who do bad, the people who, who are vicious, who do you know, hurtful, hateful things to other people, or destroy themselves, or you know, blaspheme, or whatever it is, the people who are vicious, why can it be okay for providence to punish them if they didn't have any choice in the matter? if they couldn't have possibly done otherwise. He's not just saying that they don't have merit or demerit. He's saying that that would make providence itself unfair, which would make providence, in a certain way, improvident, at least imprudent. It wouldn't be allotting things correctly, because it would be giving people things they don't deserve. Another big issue if this is really the case, if everything is totally fated, then what good would there possibly be in hoping? Hope is something that we do about something that is not yet here. It's a future-oriented uh, kind of, uh, you could call it emotion or affect or act 
on our part. But it wouldn't make sense to hope about anything. It also wouldn't make any sense to despair, I suppose, but he doesn't worry about that so much. It would, everything is just going to be as it is, including your own choices. It's sort of like somebody who says, you know, I know that this is the right thing over here, and I hope that I do the right thing, but I don't know that I will, because I don't really have any choice in the matter. It's just going to happen the way it's going to happen. Likewise, we, we can't really say anything about hoping about other people. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't even make sense to hope in in God or providence. Also, prayer couldn't possibly make sense because what is the point of a lot of prayer? Praying is, in, in large respect, asking God for something to go uh, in one way or another. Of course, there's other types of prayer as well, thanksgiving, for example, confession, all that sort of stuff. But he's talking about prayer as in beseeching God to help us out. If you think about, you know, paradigmatic prayers, um, you know, whether they be, you know, the Greek hymns to the various gods or the, the, you know, the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father that Christians have or, you know, various other prayers, quite often they're saying, God, won't you do this instead of doing that? And if everything is totally faded, all the way down to individual human actions and choices, it wouldn't make sense, for example, to pray about somebody who is making bad choices, Lord, won't you give them some insight, or won't you steer them the right way, or bring them back to, you know, some sort of sense of conscience or contrition? That wouldn't make any sense. Either that's going to happen or it's not going to happen. Your, your praying doesn't add anything to it. So if this is really the case, then what does that do to traditional conceptions of, of the human relationship to God. It, it pretty much nullifies them, doesn't it? And it also might induce a kind of despair. Uh, Boethius says that if this is really the case, then we really do have nothing to hope for, because we're so far away from God and providence that we have no way to actually get any closer. These are part of how we get closer. The solution that Boethius is going to propose to us, or philosophy rather, is going to propose to Boethius, who then is transmitting it to us, is one that may require you to do a bit of stretching in, in your thinking. And he understands that that's going to be the case because one of the issues involved in the way this problem has been set up is we've made some assumptions, some very natural assumptions for human beings to make because of the kind of beings that we are and the kind of experience of time that we have, which don't really apply quite so well to the universe, to eternity, and to the divine. So if you find yourself having trouble, you know, fab fathoming this or accepting it, 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 that's okay. It's not the sort of thing where you just set up the, the premises and the conclusion automatically follows and boy, you just see it like that, sort of like solving a math problem. Rather, you, you have to sort of think your way into this. He is going to start by talking about knowledge itself and thinking about the kinds of knowledge that we have. He's going to talk about degrees of knowledge. And these are going to correspond to different faculties, different parts of the human being. And knowledge, we often get mistaken by thinking that knowledge just depends on the object of knowledge, what it is that's being known. So to know a ball, for example, and put it in our hand, knowing that ball means knowing everything about the ball, where it came from, what it's made of, how it feels, how it bounces or doesn't bounce all those sorts of things. But if we think about it a little bit more deeply, we realize that knowledge actually depends on something else. It depends on the ability to know of the knower. It depends on what they're using to get to know that. He's going to talk in terms of faculties, but if you wanted other examples of this, you could think, for example, about when we make a distinction between knowing somebody by acquaintance and by spending time with them and just knowing their, their you know, statistics, their dossier, their 
permanent record file, right? It's not quite the same thing, is it? Those are not the same kind of knowledge. And we would say that the other person who actually has spent time with and has developed a level of intimacy with the other person knows them better than the person who's got the rap sheet. Well, it can work that way with our faculties as well. We have sense perception. You can see things, you can hear things, you can taste them, you can, you can touch them. Then we have the imagination. And the imagination for Boethius isn't just, you know, this faculty of putting images in our head and thinking about things creatively. It's also what brings together the, the sense perception so that we can grasp, for example, shape, you know. You don't actually see shapes. What you see are colors. And you don't actually, you know, feel the exact same thing perception-wise as what you're seeing. Imagination puts them together. Another word for this is, is what we call common sense. And then we have reason. This is what sets us apart from the animals. And other beings can have imagination and they react to things. So a dog sees, you know, a rabbit and chases after the rabbit. The rabbit sees a carrot, chases after the carrot. And, you know, pretty soon we get a whole progression of things. So we get something that will eat a dog, chasing the dog. Um, we actually are able to step back and think about it. We can work discursively. We can put things on a chalkboard. That's all a function of reason. Reason deals with universals, not just particulars. Then there's a higher faculty. And you can translate this as intelligence, intellect, understanding. There's different ways of, of translating the same basic idea. But the idea is that there's a higher, not really discursive, but more straightforward way of grasping things. It goes right to the heart of the matter. And we don't want to associate this necessarily with like intuition or feeling because the Boethius isn't talking about that. Much of our intuitions are really just at the level of imagination. But we do have something like this. Not that developed in human beings. But in God, that's the way God knows things. God doesn't know things through sense perception by, you know, opening his eyes and looking around. Oh, I see you down there doing bad things. I see you doing good things. That's not the way it works. God doesn't have imagination. God doesn't even, you know, have reason in the same sense that we do. Um, it's, it's sort of a hyper reason. God is intellect. That is the kind of thing that God actually is. God is God's act of knowing, you might say. And here's where we go wrong. Human reason tries to confine God's intellect, God's intelligence, God's understanding to what human reason can grasp. So it's sort of like saying, unless you can fit into my narrow categories, whatever you have to say is invalid. And, you know, what if imagination was to say that to reason? What if imagination and sense were to say to reason, there's no such thing as universals, there's no such thing as, you know, there's just horses, there's no hoarseness, there's no essence of a species, there's nothing that actually connects all these things together. Reason would say, you just don't get it, do you? You're not capable of grasping what it is that I can grasp. With God's intellect, it works a little bit like that as far as our own reasoning processes. Except that we're able to understand God to a certain extent. So how should we think about these things then? got this um, diagram here. The key thing is that God knows eternally. And we often tend to picture eternity as if it is just part of time. Remember, we have this temporal, you know, this time arrow. We start out in what's actually a present, but is going to turn into the past. You can look at it as a, everything's flowing this way, or you can look at it as everything's going this way, right? Depending on your point of view. But we have all these little slices, and at any given point in time, we're at, you know, this point, and we've got a past behind us, and we've got a future ahead of us. And by the time that we actually, like, you know, put the X there, we're already over here, we're already over there, we're moving along this thing. We don't own our past because we don't carry it with us, except perhaps in our memories and the traces upon us. We certainly don't own our future because that's yet to come for us. That's the way we experience time. That's the way that reason understands temporal events. 
and it's great. I mean, it enables us to do really super cool things. You know, the very fact that we can put clocks in place means that ultimately we could have computers and lead to, you know, wonderful digital cameras that can record videos. You know how long this video is, and we have this amazing capacity to master time. But that's not the medium in which God knows things. So if we're going by time, and we're not thinking in terms of eternity, we're going to be missing out. Eternity can be understood as one vast present that comprises and enfolds and binds together all of these times so that they're all present at the same time for eternity. You might say, man, I can't, I can't really conceive of that. that. That boggles my mind. Well, it boggles reason. It doesn't boggle intellect. And the fact that it does, you know, it's hard for us to think, is because our intellects are really not very strong. They're not the divine intellect. But the divine intellect, according to Boethius, is able to take in. It's not even able to take in. It does take in. That's what God does. God sees all of time as an eternal present with all of these times present at the same time. It sounds a little paradoxical when I put it that way, doesn't it? Now, when we get to the issue of, of foreknowledge and free acts. So a human free act from the perspective of a given point in time, it's not known what that free act is going to be. That's what it means for us for it to be a free act. That we can't say whether it's going to go or not. I'm planning on leaving, you know, on the on you know a certain date and time with my wife to drive to the Midwest to see our family. And you know, we'll you know we may we're, we we've got a plan to stay at a certain hotel on the way. That may happen. That may not happen. Maybe I take the wrong path and we end up in North Carolina instead of in the Midwest. That's a that's a contingent possibility, right? Crazier things have happened than that. Um, maybe we get a wild hair and we say, ah, forget family Christmas. We're just going to drive all the way to California. Now, that's a possibility too, right? I can say at this point in time, that's not what my plans are. But can I say with absolute certainty or possibility that that's the case? I can't. Now, once I get there and I actually make that decision and... You know, where we're driving, we get on to 80, and, you know, we see a road that would take us south, and we say, nope, I'm going to keep on going on 80, keep going west. Once we've decided that, that's now in the past. That's been decided. There is a kind of necessity to it. But it's not, because it's a free act, it's not necessary in its nature. It didn't have to be that way. That's what it is for it to be a free act. It's contingent. From the perspective of God in the eternal present, that choice has already happened. Or, in fact, it's wrong to say if it, it's already happened. It's happening at the same time as all of the other choices are happening. There is no time in eternity that can pass. All the times simply are. And so there is a kind of necessity to it. But it's not the kind of necessity this is where we get to the solution. It's not the kind of necessity that makes that free act no longer a free act. As a matter of fact, it's a necessity of it being a free act. That was decided at that point in time, or rather is decided at that point in time, which is not future for God, but is rather part of the eternal present. It's just as much part of the eternal present as the ancient history of the past, long before either, uh, you know, I was conceived of, or before my ancestors, you know, going back 40 generations were. And it's just as real for God, just as present for God, as the ultimate, you know, collapse of the universe, which perhaps may happen, we don't know, would be as well. All of that would be equally present for God. So what this means is God does, in fact, foreknow and has encompassed within this providential ordering 
human free acts. And human free acts truly are free acts. They're able to go off this way or go this way. But the plan has already included these going offs. Because the plan has existed, or exists rather, in eternity. 